they come in and they have difficulties with one thing or another, whether it be behavior or social. And then over time, you get to see them making strides, and it's really, really exciting when the goal that they're working on they achieve. Um, for instance, Jonah has um, goals with like um, reading, and he doesn't know how to read, and so we've been working on that. And he the other day said the word C, and that was one of his focus words, and it was really, really exciting. I remember just freaking out, just being like, "Oh my gosh, Jonah, this is so good! You did so good!" And he was happy, and I was happy, and. Um, you know, when I got him, he didn't really have much trust in me or any, anybody really because he was brand new to the school. And so we worked on that and he's warming up and he's saying hello to people in the hallways and he's um, talking and he's participating in things that he wasn't participating in um, originally, which was really, it was, it, it's just been really exciting to see the growth and development. Early childhood special ed, um, well, the, the certificate represents training that allows our students to serve what would be considered early childhood. So in some states that's just ages three to five, in other states it's birth to five, um, as well as children in special ed from kindergarten through third grade, both regular ed and special ed. And so in some states those are all separate certificates. In the state of Idaho they've blended all that into one certificate. So they came, come out ready to teach birth through third grade, regular ed or special ed. Everyone needs to be prepared to teach students with disabilities um, and make accommodations for students that struggle. Everyone has to be prepared for that. And so the more classes that teachers can take in an undergrad program, the more prepared they will be to deal with students that have mild to moderate disabilities. And those are going to be in your class in, in sometimes very vast numbers. Thing that is the most difficult for a lot of, um, for anybody working in this field, is the fact that you have to be able to distance your emotions uh, when the child um, is getting out of hand. Uh, Jonah will escalate very, very quickly when he doesn't get his way, or when he's tired, or he's hungry, and he'll start crying, and he'll start screaming, and he will start just throwing a temper tantrum. And it, it can be very, very stressful, especially since John is such a, he's a very big second grader. Um, and he's very, very physical and everything he does. He doesn't really know how to express himself, so the only way he knows how to express himself is through being physical and sometimes that can either mean pulling your shirt or scratching or you know punching something. If I were to go and tell someone why to choose this degree, I would tell them that um, you know it's not just you love kids or, or you like kids, it's you love kids and you want them to succeed in so many different ways. And you need to be able to reach them so that they don't hate school because school for them is hard and it's every day they have to struggle through school and if you don't like to do something typically you just don't do it. You think yeah I don't like to bowl I just won't go bowling no big deal my life will be happy. Well school's not an option if you don't like to read you don't like to write you don't like to do math you still have to get up every day and come to school and the school expects you to have a good attitude about that that's a difficult thing to do so as a teacher you really need to have as much experience with all the disabilities as possible so you can make school a positive experience for kids. You get to change a life um, and that's what teaching is all about and that's what uh, even more so special education is all about is you are giving these kids the skill sets that they need to become successful in a world that kind of doesn't know if they can be successful and I think that's the most exciting part is that you get to change a life you get to mold and shape someone into being the type of human being that wasn't easy for them to be at the beginning that was always had the potential to be there so it's almost like digging for diamonds and you get to dig for diamonds every day um, with these children. There are so many kids out there who need teachers like us and need to know that they are loved and that they're wanted and needed and um, I just hope that people actually take the time to understand how important this major really is and they just think that oh you can go play and you can go um, color but really it's not about that it's about loving the children and making sure that they know that um, they're loved and um, figuring out their best needs and wants. Hi, welcome to chapter 10. 
In this chapter, we're going to be talking about students that are deaf or hard, hard of hearing. So hopefully you'll get a, good, a better understanding of what you can do in your classroom to better serve these students. However, you will find out a lot of these students may be educated in alternate environments or other residential settings based on the level of their hearing loss. So let's start exploring. So how is deafness and hard of hearing actually defined? Well, individuals who are deaf have a profound hearing loss. They have little use of hearing even if they use a hearing aid. They can be di divided into three general groups. These are students that are congenitally deaf, prelingually deaf, and postlingually deaf. When it comes to students that are hard of hearing, these students have a hearing loss that impairs their ability to understand sounds and impairs their um, communication skills. But there are things we can do to improve their uh, residual hearing, things we can do to make sure they're learning at the, I guess, at the peak of their capabilities. Being able to take advantage of all of their uh, remaining hearing so they can learn to communicate and be independent as adults. I'm not gonna test you on the process of hearing. However, just in case you're ever asked on a game show, the outer ear catches the sound waves and the middle ear turns those waves into vibrations. You know, those little teeny tiny earbuds you stick in. You're probably doing some serious damage if you're cranking it too loud. We'll talk about noise abatement a little bit later. Once the sound goes past the middle ear, it goes into the inner ear and produces electrochemical signals that are sent through nerve cells along the auditory nerve. Some damage could take place on the auditory nerve and cause significant hearing losses. Then the brain perceives these signals and makes them meaningful. So there's multiple issues going on. You're looking at the process of actually hearing and getting the sound waves through the ear and then through the auditory nerve in the brain where the sound is processed and made into distinguishable communications for you and your students. And if you like, there's a nice little anatomy of the ear down there. Had to throw in some pictures. So what are the types of hearing loss? Well, first there's a conductive hearing loss, and this is when sound waves are actually prevented and cannot travel to the inner ear. Sensory neural loss is a little bit different. This type of hearing loss is caused by damage to the auditory nerve or inner ear. Sometimes this can be uh, remedied by surgeries, other times we'll look at some other interventions that could take place to help students gain the most out of the hearing they have. So let's look at the types or the degrees of hearing loss. As you can tell, it goes from mild to moderate to moderately severe, severe and profound. You are not going to be tested on each of these levels, but it's important for you to understand that the, there is a major difference between a mild hearing loss and a profound hearing loss, and this is measured in decibels. Here's a video using the Flintstones to better explain what I'm talking about. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha! Uh -huh. You're on my apartment building on Granite Avenue. You owe me 300 bucks. Get it up? Fred, take it easy. It's only a game. Wilma, I'm just like them big tycoons. I play to win. Now, Barney, pay up or get out of the game. It's all busted. That's one down and two to go. Betty, it's your turn. I don't have any more money either. You got it all. Then I'll take a mortgage on your open home. Well, come on. Take the dice, will you? Don't just sit there like a dummy. I will not have you talking that way to our guests. Come on, Barney. I think we'd better go home. All right, hope Fred and Barney helps you out on that one. Let's talk a little bit about the age of onset. This comes into play when we start looking at prelingually and postlingually students that have hearing impairments. Prelingually deaf means these people became deaf before they learned to speak and understand language. These people are born deaf or who lose hearing as an infant. They didn't have a chance to go through the language acquisition process. Postlingually deaf is a little bit different. These people experienced hearing loss after they learned to speak and understand and communicate in their native language. These individuals are often able to retain their abilities to use speech and communicate orally, and they can benefit from cochlear implants. We'll, we'll show a little, bit, uh, little more examples of cochlear implants later, but here's a video explaining how cochlear implants work for students with hearing issues.
In case of sound waves striking the ear, they pass through the canal to the eardrum. From there, the sound waves are mechanically transmitted to the inner ear and amplified. In the inner ear, you can find the cochlea. The cochlea consists of three different canals. The middle canal is the organ of hearing and consists of sensitive hair cells. The hair cells can be stimulated electrically and forward the signal to the nerves and then onto the brain. In most cases of deafness, the hearing nerve still remains functional, but the hair cells have been damaged or even lost. In a cochlear implant system, sound enters a microphone and travels to an external mini-computer called a sound processor. The sound is processed and converted into digital information. This digital information is sent over a transmitter antenna to the surgically implanted part of the system. The implant will turn the sound information into electrical signals that travel down to an electrode array inserted into the tiny inner ear or cochlea. The electrodes directly stimulate the auditory nerve, sending sound information to the brain. Bypassing the damaged inner ear, the cochlear implant provides an entirely new mechanism for hearing. Okay, so what are some of the common characteristics of students that are deaf or of hard of hearing? The only commonality among people who are deaf or hearing impaired is that their hearing is limited. That's it. IDEA 2004 stresses the severity of hearing loss, communication needs, and any other coexisting disabilities. Hearing issues may coexist with students we're going to talk about in Chapter 13 where multiple disabilities are present. But I want to make sure you understand there is a distinction made between deaf with a capital D and deaf with a lowercase d. Capital deaf means members, these people see themselves as members of a community. They see themselves as a minority group and they are very, very strong in membership. They do not see themselves as disabled. They use American Sign Language or ASL as their primary language and do not use oral language. When it comes to little d deaf students, 83% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. These students use oral communication at times. And it would be probably a good idea for you to check out in your text, what does CODA mean? This is children of deaf adults. These are individuals that are going to have to learn to communicate uh, with their parents. Parents are going to have to learn sign language and figure out what educational technique is going to work best for their child. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. So how prevalent is this? Hearing loss in children is the number one birth defect in the United States. It affects 14% of all of our students. Statistics about special ed students with hearing loss are unreliable due to different criteria between our 50 states. Another important fact in this disability area is over half of all adults over the age of 70 currently have hearing problems. I can tell you my father had hearing problems for years, finally came to this university to our speech and language department. They hooked him up with hearing aids. It is phenomenal. Just seeing his new zest for life, hearing uh, birds for the first time, hearing ambient sounds that he hadn't heard before, it was a real struggle. A lot of individuals um, in our aging popula population, as my father, denied that there was any hearing issue for the longest time. And having it remedied was one of the best things he's ever done. I can't say enough about the speech and language department um, on our university. It's done wonders for my father. So what are the causes and so things we can do to prevent hearing losses? Once again, most causes are unknown. A lot of it can be traced back to heredity and genetics. Uh, th there are diseases such as meningitis and otis mita that can, contri can contribute to significant hearing loss in individuals. Also noise. 
extremely loud noise. So a lot of times with the technology we have today when it comes to uh, listening to music, and I am a huge fan, but I definitely know I have had a significant hearing loss as I've gotten older. I've been to over 150 concerts and that could not help. Also worked in a lot of loud factories, probably in no another uh, strike against my hearing. So how can we prevent this? Noise abatement. Do the best job you can to protect children from extremely loud and damaging noises and also make sure children are prop properly immunized. So how can we overcome these challenges? Well, we have hearing aids and we have cochlear implants. Hearing aids are the most prevalent uh, intervention used for individuals with hearing issues. They amplify sound and there are two different types. The first one is analog. An analog makes all sounds louder, including backgrounds and speech. However, new digital technology hearing aids automatically adjust volume by amplifying sounds only to a degree necessary. They're able to technologically filter out unneeded sounds or background noises. Cochlear implants are surgically implanted as you've seen. And they include those four parts, the microphone, the speech processor, the transmitter, and the electrode array. Here's a short little video showing you how hearing aids work. Hi, my name is Tom Higgins. We're going to talk about how each of these devices is programmed for an individual's needs. We start with an audiogram. When a patient comes in for an audiogram, the hearing professional will look in the individual's ear to make sure that there is no debris or blockage in the ear. They'll also ask several questions like, do you have any dizziness? any rapid hearing loss. Uh, they might even ask what medications you're taking. To create an audiogram or the results of your hearing test, we use what we call an audiometer to present the different tones. Just, uh, when you hear a tone, raise your hand. From that audiogram, that's where we get the information when to properly program a digital hearing aid, or any hearing aid for that matter, to select the proper amplification. Hopefully that video showed you how hearing aids work and gave you a little better explanation. However, here's a video showing the effects of a cochlear implant. Get your tissues ready, because this girl is going to be hearing herself for the first time in a long time. Okay, so now we are going to turn this one on. It's going to be your microphone. Okay. You may not remember the first day with this one, but it's not going to sound good. <laughs> um, I know that things are going to sound really um, monotone, so my voice, your mom's voice, Lauren's voice will prob probably all sound the same. Uh -huh. um, the, um, there's a definite chance that you won't be able to tell noises from voices, so okay. you'll hear, but you won't really know what it is that you're hearing. Like shaking. <laughs> That's okay. Put your other one back on. So you're gonna hear with both together. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be exciting. Okay. What do you think? How's Hi, baby. Both together. He sounds good. <laughs> oh, oh, tissues. I meant to bring some in here. So we're gonna need them. There aren't any. Let me grab some from next door. I have some in my purse. I have some. Does it really? That awful. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. I, I know I look like an elderly munchkin, but do I sound like one now? <laughs> How's my laugh? Oh, thank you. We should have brought them in before. Okay. Does it sound like what you imagined? I don't know. No? no? <laughs> Better or worse? Uh, different. Different? Okay. It's higher pitch than my other one. Okay. Sorry, you can turn it off. Can you hear it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yay! <laughs> sound good? It sounds 
same as before? Yeah. Oh my god! What? <laughs> That's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, T Pain does sound like yeah. a tin can, so. <laughs> yeah. What did I get to try? I got to try a different song. Yeah, um. Pick something different. What is it? This is great. What are you listening to? Uh. Wait, that's not an appropriate song. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to get over it. It sounds the same. Oh my god, that's awesome. But that's impossible. Uh, for the girls, the thrill. <laughs> Sound the same? Yeah. Yes! Yes! Oh, I can see what he's saying. No, you cannot. Educated, she graduated. Yeah. No problem. So we don't have to go to country? <laughs> <laughs>
What can we do not only just to support the child, but to support the family the child is going to be living with, that ch- it's going to be learning from? We got to do all we can. So how do we teach students with hearing loss? Access to the general curriculum is extremely prevalent. However, some students are going to be educated in more restrictive environments, and I'll explain why. Interpretation for the least restrictive environment for the deaf community is different for many advocates and parents with students with intellectual disabilities. Many of them believe the general education environment with an interpreter is too restrictive. Deaf advocates believe that deaf students should learn the deaf culture. They should learn American Sign Language. They should move away from oralism. And many advocate for residential schools. We do have an Ohio School for the Deaf as well as an Ohio School for the Blind. They provide specialized instruction for these individuals. All right, and teaching students with hearing loss, students that are hard of hearing usually find a proper uh, amplification allows them to benefit in a typical classroom. Classroom instruction with some accommodations to allow the students to hear the lectures better, to interact with others more appropriately, is probably going to be the best thing for them. Accommodations can focus on the teacher's communication between them and the students, additional teacher assistance, or assistance from classmates. Here's an example of an amplified classroom using a smart program. If you don't have one of these in your school, it's going to be important for you to go out and figure out what type of ampli- amplification system can best meet the needs of all your students. It's not just for students with hearing impairments. It's going to benefit everyone. Check out the video and you'll see what I mean. Hey smart users, Kyle here again. And today I'm going to show you how to use the Smart Classroom Amplification System. Did you know that in good acoustic environment classrooms, students with good hearing still only pick up 71% of the speech they hear? And in poor listening environments, the number drops to 30%. With the Smart Audio System, it enables the students at the back of the class to hear just as good as the ones in the front. This creates a better learning environment for everyone. The Smart Audio System includes a microphone, a control unit, and a room module. The microphone uses an infrared signal to transmit the speaker's voice to the room module. This means you should keep the microphone within the room module's line of sight. You can do this very easily by attaching the included lanyard and wearing it around your neck. A microphone includes a rechargeable battery. A typical charge takes about an hour for up to eight hours of use. Let's take a closer look at the microphone. To turn the microphone on, just pick it up and press any button on it. To turn it off, press and hold the mute button down for four seconds. To adjust the volume, press the volume up button or the volume down button. If you need to mute the audio, press the mute button once and again to unmute. The smart audio system integrates with your smart notebook collaborative learning software which allows you to conveniently control the audio from your SmartBoard Interactive Whiteboard. By pressing the Smart Audio icon on your Smart Notebook software toolbar, you can mute or change the volume of a microphone, audio files playing on your computer, or audio playing on an auxiliary device you've connected, and also set the tone for your speakers. So this was a quick look at the Smart Audio system. If you're interested in this topic or any other smart product, I've left a link in the bottom bar to the Smart Training Professional Development page. As well, if you've liked this video, make sure you hit the like button, hit the subscribe button above, and leave your comments in the section below. As always, class dismissed. Back to teaching students with hearing losses, education approaches for deaf students focus on a number of different approaches. The first one is teaching them oral communication only. Second is manual communication or sign language only. The second one is what you're going to hear called TC, which means total communication. It's immersion in oral language as well as using um, American Sign Language to help express wants and needs while they're learning the oral language. There's cued speech and a bilingual bicultural approach. 
I think the most important one for you to know is total communication. That's the one that's most prevalent in schools. And I believe, and this is my personal opinion, the most beneficial to the student as well as the family. It is allowing students to learn oral language, but also provides temporary communication styles through American Sign Language. So communication and education can take place. As far as technology goes for this, for this group of individuals, there are many assistive listening devices. We already talked about the most prevalent, which is hearing aids. There are cochlear implants. There are FM modulated systems. This is where the teacher is actually mic'd up and it goes directly to the student's hearing, um, hearing amplification system. There's also telecommunication devices, which have captions, open and closed, um, text to telephone. Almost all TVs now are universally designed then have closed captioning uh, software already in them. And this benefits everybody. If you go to a busy airport, if you're at a busy restaurant, a lot of them have that turned on so you could read what's going on if you can't hear the sound. And there's also alerting devices for security and safety for students and adults. Here's a video explaining assistive technology for students with hearing and vision issues. When it comes to transition to adulthood for this population, there are many school to work programs that are designed to improve adult outcomes. This will help them obtain equitable employment, earn a fair wage, increase their job satisfaction. And I'm gonna show you a video here that looks at Gallaudet University, where students experience, experience a high rate of success. And Gallaudet is a university specifically designed for individuals with hearing impairments. Let's check it out. Yeah, you're that defense. That's all we need to do is 
no adjustments needed. Three straight three and outs, hey. everything you need to know. They come from 23 different states to play football at Division III Gallaudet University. Not because they get an athletic scholarship, they don't. Not because it's a traditional powerhouse, it isn't. But because there's no place in the world like it. Gallaudet is the only university specifically for deaf and hard of hearing people. Some people only have 5% hearing loss. Some are completely deaf, so there's a range. If you're hired here at Gallaudet University, you're gonna learn a new language, it must. But at the end of the day, we all learn, we sign, we communicate, and we play football, and we play, we play hard. If we're behind, you don't quit. If we jump on their ass, we don't quit. If we're in a tight game, we don't quit. Well, when people realize that we're deaf, they look at me with a really sorry face, saying, well, really, you can't speak and you can't talk? Oh, okay. You know, but because of the fact that I can't speak or hear doesn't mean that I'm dumb. In a mainstream school, they're not gonna raise their hand and ask a teacher again, say, I missed it, because, you know, their friends in the back are like, oh, again, you know, slowing down. Here at Gay, that doesn't happen. They never miss nothing. 10 11, fine. Opposite, that's fine. Okay. The bison execute their game plan with a chain reaction of silent efficiency that even the pros would envy. Go, 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 go. Everything that I use is an American Sign Language, but it happens really quickly and the opponents can't really understand us, so that is something that we use to our advantage. You know, I've wanted to write Peyton Manning a, a letter and asked him, have you ever considered using American Sign Language instead? You know, because at any time, he's gonna run out of these gestures. He's only limited to how many he can use. Deaf people are famous for making a lot of noise because they don't know how much noise they're making. Gallaudet started playing football in 1883 but have never before qualified for the NCAA postseason. I remember clearly when I first arrived here, our preseason rankings were at 234 out of 238 teams in Division Three. It looked like it was a throwaway program and that there really was no chance for it or no hope. It's hard to find deaf and hard of hearing football players. A lot of players though come from nowhere. I'm not even sure how the coaches even found them. Maybe they Googled them, I'm not sure. A bare minimum roster of 54 has had its challenges. Among them, integrating players. It was a, a huge issue actually. It divided the locker room between those individuals who could speak and hear versus the other individuals that were deaf and used American Sign Language. Some players were just stay with their own group and just hang around with those guys. This year, that's just gone away. We've all been one group, one unit, one team. We have to adapt to who we have on the team. And that is the main reason why we're doing so well this year. An unprecedented 9-0 start clinched the first conference title in school history. And that elusive postseason dream has come true. It's bringing Gaida University together. I'm just glad our players had the opportunity to play. When we win! So collaboration in your classroom. Teachers and educational interpreters need to work as teams. A close relationship is needed between the teacher and the related service provider. This is really important when you're talking about delivering uh, information at the college level, information at the high school level. Interpreters have to be trained in specific, uh, I guess you call it sign language topics, because you know, learning f uh, terms for uh, physics, terms for history, terms for mathematics, they're going to have to become experts in that subject area to help the student learn. You're going to have to plan and organize your classroom setting up times for uh, standard meetings so you can help work out some of these issues. 
you're also going to need to provide storage and working space for the interpreter. I've had interpreters in my college classes before. It has worked out fantastically. No complaints. But just in case you're going to be working with an interpreter in your classroom, here's a video on some of the do's and don'ts to make your classroom a more effective environment for students with hearing impairments. Not everyone has worked with an interpreter. This video will provide you with some helpful tips for when you are working with an interpreter. Only qualified interpreters should be used. Qualified interpreters are expected to adhere to a professional code of conduct and access regular professional development. Qualified interpreters must remain impartial, confidential, professional and truthful. You do not need to worry that information will be repeated. Information communicated during an appointment where a qualified interpreter is present will remain confidential. Interpreters will not speak on behalf of the deaf consumer. This means they will not make follow-up appointments for the deaf consumer. It is the responsibility of the interpreter to verbalise everything that is signed and sign everything that is spoken. Conversations will not be censored or edited. Refrain from engaging in private discussions with an interpreter which you do not want interpreted. Private discussions can be offensive to the deaf client and embarrassing for the interpreter. It is the right of the deaf consumer to choose any qualified interpreter they want to attend their appointment. Deaf consumers are not under any obligation to have an interpreter present that they are not comfortable with and they can choose to say no to any interpreter they do not want. It is the right of both the deaf consumer and the professional to have a qualified interpreter present at the appointment for legal and other reasons, including informed consent. Interpreters should be early for an appointment. This allows adequate time to inform the reception staff and introduce themselves to the deaf consumer. Positioning in the appointment or meeting room is important. The interpreter in consultation with the deaf consumer and professional can assist with organising the best position. This is so that the deaf consumer can see both parties. When working with an interpreter, the professional should speak directly to the deaf consumer. As the professional, you should speak clearly and at your regular pace. The interpreter will inform you if you need to change pace. The deaf consumer may ask questions if they are unsure of the message that is being conveyed. You may notice that there is a slight lag time in what is being spoken and what is signed. This ensures accuracy of information between both languages. The degree of delay will vary according to interpreters and the complexity of the material. If you have any questions about working with an interpreter, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, to build on that collaboration, remember, you're gonna be organizing your classroom so the interpreter and the student are able to see you or the teacher or whoever is presenting the lesson. The placement shouldn't be distracting to other students. There should be no glare or visual obstruction. And another, another uh, I guess you'd call it, another rule. If you're going to be working with students that are deaf and have, uh, they use um, lip reading, important not to chew gum or have anything in your mouth when you're talking because that definitely messes up the process. Courtesy and social convention should be considered. Make sure you're looking at the student, not at the interpreter. Everyone should talk to the student and use appropriate eye contact. And please remember, the interpreter is not a tutor. They are not a teacher. They're there to help facilitate communication between you and the student. Let's talk about families. This is the most important factor in a child's life that is suffering from a hearing impairment. Families acceptance and inclusion having a nurturing environment where communication can take place. Social services need to respond quickly and early for interventions 
uh, when concerning families that have children with hearing impairments. These families experience stress with these adjustments and they have to uh, develop strategies fairly quickly in order for their child to grow, learn language, and any type of academic intervention. Let's review the information from Chapter 10. What is the most commonly used listening device that I've discussed? Is it a hearing aid? The flashlight telephone? A laptop computer? Or sign language? It's definitely not the flashlight telephone. Right, it's the hearing aid. This is the most prevalent device used by students with hearing issues. Let's check out another one. This position advocates both oral and manual communication systems for the instruction of deaf students. Is it total communication? Is it oralism? Supported manual method? Or the combination approach? That's right. Total communication, TC for short. This, uh, this position advocates learning sign language while they're also learning oral language. It's a combination approach, but remember, it's total communication. All right, last question. According to your text, the most important factor in a deaf child's life is academic achievement, family acceptance and inclusion, life skills, or oral language skills? That's right, family acceptance and inclusion. All right, if you have any questions, remember to contact me or Sarah Noble. Also, the next chapter will focus on individuals with low vision and blindness, and we're gonna be moving into the final part of the semester, which will focus on module three. Good luck, talk to you soon. Yeah. Sakura, can you hear me now? Good, very loud freaky is all I hear. Do you hear me talking? How about right there? Yeah. Do you hear me talking? No. How about right there? Yeah. I hear myself too. Right. So does my voice sound real squeaky? Yeah. Yeah. So what I was telling James was that your right ear has had no hearing. Now I'm giving you hearing like this. Almost like normal hearing. So that's why it's going to take some time for your brain to understand what your ear is hearing. You know? So it may sound loud, but by Monday when I see you again, we're going to do that same thing where you hear the beep and you raise your hand. It'll be different. Okay. So this is not the perfect map, mm -hmm. but it's going to get us there. Okay. So does it sound like um, too soft? Does no. it sound like I'm shouting at you? Okay. Yes. You, with your remote control, I'm going to have you just listen to me for a few minutes while I talk about this, you know, so when we finish, you'll be able to control the loudness. So I don't want it so soft, though, that you can't hear anything because mm -hmm. that defeats the purpose of having this, you know. But I don't want it so loud that, you know, you're like that. But remember, like, do you have pets? Mm -hmm. Okay. A dog? Cat? Dog. Dog. So, you know, if the dog is a barky dog, Okay, good. Then it's going to sound different, but you need to hear my voice. Now, James, you say something. How's my voice sound? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's my voice sound? Yours is loud. Okay. Different from mine? Different. <laughs> what do you think? It's amazing. 